Hi, everyone. We're here with the amazing New York Times and USA Today bestselling author, Abby Jimenez, as she writes these amazing contemporary romances with very memorable, relatable, and hilarious characters. Uh, so thank you, Abby, for being willing to chat with us today. I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. I love doing Yay. events from home. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, same here. Introverts unite. <laughs> um, so I am so excited for this video. I think everybody's going to get a lot of value from you and they're just going to really enjoy hearing from you on your expertise, but also your author journey. So I thought I'd break this up into two sections. Um, first, like I said, your author journey, how you got started, how you got published, kind of your writing process. I think a lot of writers on this channel are going to love hearing that. And then second, uh, I'm super excited to learn from you about things like romance and how you write this amazing dialogue. But again, really the romance, that's one of my weak areas. So I'm hoping to learn a lot from you today. Uh, so uh, let's start with your author journey. And um, I'm just going to plug your um, cupcake business really quick. Nadia Cakes, if you guys don't know, Abby has this amazing cupcake store shop. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> in the area. Um, actually, how many stores do you have? You have more than one, right? Yeah, we have three. We have one in okay. the suburbs of Minneapolis, one in the suburbs of St. Paul, and then one in Palmdale, California, where oh my gosh. I founded the company. I love that. And so you were like an entrepreneur way before you got into writing. Um, and so I just wanted to plug that and say, I highly recommend that. Um, I live dangerously close to one. <laughs> and I think I told you when we met that when I was pregnant, we went there every night. Uh, so what made you transition into writing after like being in that world? And it's very different, or maybe it's not that different. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're both, for me, they were both creative outlets, but um, I guess my writing journey started in high school. Well, it started, actually, it started earlier than that. It started when I was a, 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 wee, a wee lass. Um, <laughs> I, I was an avid reader. I've always been an avid reader. And in high school, I took creative writing all four years. Um, I was in honors English, but I never went to college. I didn't go to culinary school for the baking thing, and I didn't go to wow. college. Um, I opened up all of my bakeries and I was really consumed with that, um, for a really long time. Every time I would open a bakery, I would have to work in the kitchen for about two years. And after I opened my last one and the two year mark hit, um, I was able to kind of free myself up and get back to some of my hobbies, which was reading. And I was on this camping trip up in the boundary waters. Um, that's like remote Northern Minnesota, like border of Canada. And uh, I started, it was, there was this thunderstorm and we were in the tent with the kids. And of course, like nothing works out there, like your cell phone doesn't work. <laughs> and I started telling them this, um, this story idea that I had for this like dystopian YA romance. And my daughter really loved it. And she was like, mom, you should write this. So I went home and I started writing this, what was, what was going to be a very terrible YA book that was ridiculously long. It was like 300,000 words long. And um, I actually queried this monstrosity to an agent and the agent really gently told me, you know, I think you'd benefit from getting some critique partners. So I found this website called Critique Circle and started to run this book through that through there and learned really, really early on that this book was terrible, but that <laughs> people really liked my dialogue. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to trunk this. I'm just going to, I'm just going to throw it out and I'm going to wow. start a whole new romance and it's going to be contemporary and I'm going to switch to first person and I'm going to do dual POVs because I love dual, dual POVs. Me too. And <laughs> I ended up writing the happy ever after playlist, um, in this, in this critique group. And the book was so well received that I had the courage again to go and query an agent. And this time I did it the right way. And this time I had a really, I actually had a really good book. Um, I learned how to write on this site. It was like a writing boot camp. Uh, I was on there for a whole year. I would spend eight to 12 hours a day on Critique wow. Circle, just like, you know, earning the credits to submit my own chapters, critiquing other people's work, um, learning how to write basically. Wow. And uh, I ended up getting my very first pick agent on my very first query. Oh my goodness. And yeah. It's on the strength of that book. So that, wow. I mean, um, that was very encouraging, but don't think that it was like easy. After that. <laughs> Cause I got rejected by every single agent that I queried after her. I queried <laughs> six in total and I got like rejections for months after. And then of course spent like nine months in the publishing, uh, you know, submissions trenches where all I heard was no for nine months straight. Um, you know, people wow. kind of didn't know, I think where to put my books. Gotcha. Um, you know, they're, they're funny, but they're, they also have a lot of depth and they touch on a lot of real life issues. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think 
romance publishers are at the time, especially were looking for either lighter fiction or they were looking for heavy fiction and they weren't really mm. looking for something that was sort of both, you know? Yeah. Um, I ended up finally getting a book deal and uh, got a three book deal and then got another three book deal wow. and I'm getting ready to sign another book deal. So oh my gosh. Get at least eight <laughs> books out of me, um, probably many, many more because I'm having a really good time. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's my writing journey. And I never knew that you could be an author without having like the street creds. Like I thought you had to be like a journalist <laughs> or something, you know, like you had to, you yes. had to, you had to <laughs> column or you had to. I don't know. You had to have like a master's degree in English. I, yeah. that's what I think. I mean, a lot of people think that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know what? You don't. I mean, you no. do have to learn how to write. Um, <laughs> you're good at it. Um, yeah. and you know, but I was able to do that on my own uh, through that website. So that wow. that's my writing journey. That's and so I love cool. romance. I, I just, that's all I want to write is romance. Yes. Oh my gosh. I have so many questions now because like that website you're talking about sounds really cool. And then I also am really curious what, like what you learned from it. Did you like, was it a lot of back and forth, a lot of like critique partner you said kind of, so or the more? That, the yeah. way that it works is it's a tit for tat community. So okay. every week you submit a chapter of your book wow. and other people critique it. But the only way that you can submit your chapter is by getting credits by critiquing other people's work. Oh. So you're reading, you know, other people's chapters that are anywhere from like 2000 to 6,000 words long, and you have to write them a 300 word critique minimum wow. um, just to get the credits to submit yours. So you're, you know, I think like learning how to critique other people's work, it, it forces you to break it down and understand why this isn't working for you. Like what mm. about it doesn't, isn't jiving. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I feel like that really helped. And then the website has every resource you can imagine. It has these fabulous forums that teach you how to write dialogue, um, oh, wow. you know, how to query an agent, how to build suspense, how to write a suspenseful scene, like anything wow. you can imagine, like these really, really wonderful uh, forums that you can, you know, resources that you can tap into. Wow. Um, and then, of course, your critique partners, you find really, really fabulous, very helpful critique partners that are genuinely invested in your stories that help you grow and build your work. So, like um, yeah, it's a fabulous website. A anybody that is serious about learning how to write, I recommend that site. That's like my number one recommendation. Wow. Um, and it, it truly was a boot camp. I mean, I was on there. I was on there a year. It was wow. exhausting. What's the um, name of it again? It's called... <laughs> circle. Okay. And it's, um, you know, you're going to find critique partners all over the world. Uh, mm -hmm. I had people in Australia reading my books wow. in England and just, you know, all over the place. Um, it was a really, it, I credit that for where I am today. I would not be wow. here if it wasn't for that. Oh my gosh. I love that. I want to dig into that more then. It's not one of my questions, but I can just hear everybody watching, asking me this, like in the mm -hmm. comments, they'll want to know, like, how did you handle being able to both put yourself out there, first of all, but then also maybe were there any like, I don't know how to say this, like difficult people to work with? Because I have a feeling not everybody gave great feedback. I know I've experienced some awesome feedback, very helpful, and then some people who are not as constructive. So how did you handle that side of it? I <laughs> the would say... <laughs> That like 95% of the people on Critique Circle are genuinely helpful. And wow. that's the thing too, is like in receiving critiques, you learn how to critique, you learn mm. what is helpful. So people that have been on the site learn how to give constructive criticism. It's the okay. same kind of, crit I mean, they're in the same trenches as you, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. They're not going to give you mean feedback because they don't want to get mean feedback either. And the polite thing to do is... Um, if somebody critiques your work is to turn around and critique theirs, you know, okay. the tit for tat. Yeah. Um, so I'd say like most people are really nice. There was this one girl who was notoriously just mean. Oh no. So mean. I, <laughs> oh, and no. Well, here's the thing, like she was like brutally, <laughs> like unnecessarily mean, but also wow. her critiques were really valid and like Oh really no insightful so it was like no I don't want Susie to critique my stuff but also hope she does yes um, yeah. <laughs> yeah so I don't know and, and if you don't want if if you ever do get mean feedback they have features where you can block people you know so oh, okay be able to see your work yeah um, but for the most part I found it to be a very respectful very useful community and I walked away with friends from that site that I still have wow years later wow um, 
So yeah, highly recommend it. I love that. You're making me want to join that. <laughs> I love it. Um, and do you, I feel like maybe reviews are the same way almost where you can kind of learn from them as well. It's about that thick skin that you have to have maybe. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe you don't read reviews. I don't know. I shouldn't assume. <laughs> well, I, you know, I read them like right at the very beginning when That's my smart. books come out as advanced reader copies, just to sort yeah. of like see what the general consensus is. And then I yeah. will take that and like put it into, you know, what I, whatever I've learned in my next book, but it gets so repetitive. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> you're going to hear, you know, after you've, after you've read maybe like the first 50, every review is just going to repeat what the first 50 said. And you don't need yeah. to like put yourself through that. A million yes. more times. <laughs> um, but yeah. I, I, some authors don't read them at all. I do find it I do find it useful because it's like almost, it's a control group. You know what yeah. I mean? Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe you're leaning too heavily on a crutch word and people me are mentioning it. And so now the next book, you're not going <laughs> to lean on that crutch word. Uh, Interesting. You know, things like that. Yeah. And I feel like because you are so incredibly successful, uh, a lot of people will just assume that you get all good reviews. Honestly, mm -hmm. like you do so well. So I'm curious, like when you do get the harsher reviews, this is again, not a planned question. I apologize, but I'm just very curious for my own sake too. Like, how do you handle that? And because you do so amazing, obviously you're an amazing writer, but there's all those people out there that are always critical. And I feel like we all run into that. But <laughs> uh, you are never going to please everyone. Yeah. Like one thing I always think about is there's a, there's a few things that I, that I do to like manage how I feel about bad reviews. The first mm. thing to remember is that there are people that don't even like water. <laughs> okay. So like, oh my gosh. I love yeah, that. <laughs> so nobody likes everything. Okay. Yeah. Nobody likes everyone. You <laughs> have people that you don't like, so you can't expect for everyone to like you or like what you do. And also, uh, you know, the way that people receive your book is so subjective. It's based on personal experiences. It's based on personal gripes. It's boost on. It, it's based on what mood they're in in that yeah. moment. Um, you know, so you do have to take all of it with a grain of salt. You know, I think that there are de there's definitely merit to trying to write a book that is um, not problematic. Trying mm -hmm. to write a book that is responsible and depicts mm -hmm. things. Um, realistically, you know, I do, I, I have yeah. a lot of sensitivity readers now and beta okay. readers now because I don't want somebody to read my book and get thrown out of the story because of an inaccuracy that was really easily researched. Um, you know, so I do think that there's merit in trying to avoid bad reviews through avenues mm -hmm. like that. Um, but you're never going to please everybody. And the, and the, the number one practice, like this is my number one advice to anybody who's new, who's a baby author and they're dealing <laughs> with the bad reviews. I want you to go and I want you to find your absolute favorite book in the universe on Goodreads. And you go and you click on that book and you read their one star reviews. Oh, and yeah. Really see how much BS it is. Okay. Yeah. Because <laughs> that is your perfect book. And that book has one star reviews. Yeah. It, it's so subjective, you know? Um, and, and I really like, I don't, I don't beat myself up about it. The ones that drive me bonkers, um, is like where people sometimes use the rating system to mm -hmm. rate uh, how much they want to read that book. Mm. The people do that. And that, I'm just oh, yeah. like, Who's, are you being for real right now? Like, yeah. the, the, like the, the book isn't even out yet. Um, there's like not even advanced copies out yet. And, so and there's a one star. Like a three star. Yeah, they'll read yeah. three stars because that's the rating system. So when they go back later, they know um, that's how they feel about reading this book. I'm like, Maybe. I'm like, are you serious? No. Yeah, there should be police. Um, yeah. but you know, as far as yes. like the actual reviews go, you know, it's, it's all subjective. You can't, you can't let it get to you. Yeah. And, if, and, and like, if you know that you're sensitive to it, don't go there. Like don't mm -hmm. read those reviews because it really squashes your creativity. It really does. Yeah. It does. Yeah, for sure. It kind of pulls you out of wanting to write at all sometimes. Mm -hmm. I can it see does. that for sure. Oh, I love that. Thank you. So then, okay, so I got to navigate back to my questions because I was on a tangent there. <laughs> um, so coming back to like your timeline, I guess, uh, what was that like for you from start to when you got published? Like how you said you were on the site for a year and then you were nine months or something like that for querying? Yes. So it was a really fast timeline. That's so awesome. I started writing this really terrible YA in the <laughs> summer. Okay. It was like, okay. this, I want to say it was the summer of 2015. And um, I ended up getting on Critique Circle around February okay. of 2016. And I, I put that really terrible book into the queues 
And it was only like two or three weeks that I was like writing that book through. And I was like, oh, this is awful. And I very oh, no. remember we went on spring break and we went on this cruise. And when I was on the cruise, that's when I started writing the Happy Ever After playlist and running wow. through the cues. So that was in March of 2016. And I, I think it was August when I started querying my agents. So March, April, May, June, July. Yeah, it was six months. Wow. So it took me six months to, to write that book. Um I started querying the agent in August. I had my agent by like late August, early September. And then I was in submissions for nine awful months. Nine oh, no. Months. <laughs> that um, means yeah. where your uh, your agents bring it to publishing houses, right? Yes. Okay. And oh, man. Like nothing but no. I got a wow. revise and resubmit request from a top five publisher. And um, I I did. I, re I revised the ending of that book. And... Um, they still rejected it at the end. And then they offered me a three book bakery series romance deal. And I, I love was, that. I was offended. <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> I'm not going to get pigeonholed into writing bakery romances. Just okay. because I'm a baker, you yeah. know, like I get it, but like, no, I wanted to write <laughs> these books. Like I was not in it. This is the thing. And I think this is like maybe part of the success that I have is that I wasn't in it to become a published author. That wasn't like my dream. You know, I wasn't willing to sell my soul to make this happen at any cost. Right. I wanted to publish these books, not any book. I didn't want to be an author. You know, I didn't want to just be able to be an author any way I could get to it. Yeah. Um, so I actually turned that deal down. And I think my agent thought it was crazy. I think there's a lot of times <laughs> like, she's crazy. <laughs> it always works out. Um, then I had submitted, um, oh, and I should mention, while I was in submissions, I asked my agent, what do you think about me writing the best friend's love story, which you can see it back here. Is yes. the friend's love. And I love that one. And if you know that this is the first book in my series, and then the Happy Ever After playlist came next, um, my agent thought that was a great idea. So I went back and I wrote The Friend Zone, ran it through, you know, critique circle. It took me only about three months to write that book. And then we started wow. leaving with that book as the first in the series. So that's why that book comes out first, because chronologically it's first. That makes um, sense. But when I was in... Um, submissions to publishers, I actually submitted those two books in the Golden Hearts contest on RWA, um, Romance Writers of, Amer of America, and both of them scored low. Oh. One person actually uh, marked uh, the, the Happy Ever After playlist as not a romance in an attempt to get it disqualified. What? It was so demoralizing. And I was like, it's wild. I was like, my poor wow. agent. She's never gonna make a penny <laughs> off of me. This woman made a bad investment. And she oh, me on horse. Um, yeah, and uh, wow. of course, you know, I did end up getting a book deal, and you know, she was she was right. Yes, um, <laughs> uh, it was it was rough. Like it's it's no joke being being in submissions, querying like that stuff is brutal. And then you think you're done, you know, you're like. <laughs> like, I've got a book deal now. I've got an agent. I'm in. And then you get the reviews, you know? And oh, yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> it just keeps coming. Starts all over again. But I'm so glad that you persevered and pressed through that because there are people who really need that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to read those really dark books, but I do love that your books are addressing real stuff. They're not, they're not fluff either. You know, that, like you said, they're right in the middle. They give you the best of both worlds. I love that. Uh, so I think a lot of people appreciate that, honestly. And so is, is your writing process the same now as when back when you started or has it changed quite a bit? It is fundamentally the same. So I don't write synopsises. I don't write outlines. Okay. Um, I don't do like any sort of like character brainstorming. I write my books in my head. I love I think that. about them <laughs> for months and I write them in my head. And um that's just my process. And I don't write anything until I'm ready to write, till I know the whole story from start to finish. Wow. And then, and this is the only thing that's different from like when I was in Critique Circle, then I have to write a synopsis because it turns out that like editors don't like to be surprised. So you actually <laughs> have to give them like, this is what yeah. Um, I will sit down and I'll write a full synopsis for my editor and then send it to her. And then we'll have a phone call and we'll chat about it. Um, and then once we've gone over it and she likes the direction that I'm taking it, um, then I will sit down and I'll start writing and wow. I write on my cell phone a lot. Um, that way I can write wherever I am. Um, I just like to have it be very organic. And I specified when I got a book deal, I do not want to write more than one book a year because okay. this is fun for me. 
I don't ever want to burn out on this. Um, I got very burnt out making cakes because I didn't have any breaks. I didn't have any help. Mm -hmm. And I never feel the urge to decorate cakes ever again in my whole life. And I'm very, yeah, yeah, like I burned that out (laughs) for myself and it was something I was really, really good at and, you know, passionately loved and Mm -hmm. that I never got that desire back. I'm very cognizant that that can also happen with the books. So I don't, um, I don't force it. Uh, I like my writing to be very organic. I like that I get a ton of time to write these books. So I'm not like rushing on a deadline. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's it. That's my writing process. Um, I love that. It's not very structured. <laughs> but it's yeah. honestly, it's so relaxed and like makes it fun again. And it brings the joy back. <laughs> yeah. The only rule that I have is, well, I don't write unless I'm ready to write. Um, and I don't write until after 12 o'clock noon. Because until after just- 12? until after 12 o'clock that's smart. and that's just because okay. whenever I write, even if I do like a Facebook <laughs> post before 12 o'clock noon, there's yeah. typos in it. It's like not coherent. Yes. Like I just, I need to be awake <laughs> for several hours. I need to eat. I need to be caffeinated. <laughs> like I just, I've learned that anything that I write before 12 is going to need to be fixed. It's not <laughs> so I yeah. just don't, I just don't do it. I'm like, just, you know where it's going to be like, Abby, leave it alone. Yes. I'm so there. I'm like, not a morning person. Do you write like late at night then? I found my best writing is like two in the morning sometimes. Um, it's really I, bad. I, my brain tends to like start shutting down on me at around 10 PM. So that's yeah. about as late as I'll go. Gotcha. But yeah. So I've got like a, you know, like a 10 hour window that I yeah. can sit down and write. Um, lately wow. I have been really carving out time to write, making it more of like a job. Mm. Um, just because my life has become so busy. Like I've, yeah. I've gotten really, really active on social media and that's sort of like turned into another job. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, for or sure. Like a hobby, <laughs> I guess, that I really, really like. And I've got three kids. I have four dogs. My house is like an international airport. And um, <laughs> I find that when I don't exit myself and like go to the lake house or like go get a hotel for a few days and, mm-hmm. you know, sit down and carve out time to write, um, I work a lot slower. Mm. I find the quality of my writing is a lot better when I'm like sort of sequestered somewhere than when I'm sitting yeah. here trying to write and like people are knocking on the front door and like deliveries are showing up and the kids yeah. are like coming from school. It's just, it's too hard to stay focused. I totally get that. I can't do that at all when there's chaos going on, but it sounded like you kind of did in the beginning with, if you're writing on your phone and I think you had mentioned at games and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Or- um, I, I did write quite a bit on my phone. Like I would go for a walk and write on my phone or I'd be floating on the lake and, you know, write on my phone. Yes. Um, I don't know (laughs) why lately that just feels harder to do. Like it feels harder to focus around here. I don't know. It's because like my kids are, you know, older teenagers now, for some reason Mm -hmm. that just feels like so much more disruptive. Yeah. I can Um, see that. (laughs) We're like little, I don't know. I don't know why. I I mean, maybe there was like this sweet spot when they were like, you know, 12 (laughs) and they're playing outside with their friends a lot, you know, and now they're just like broody, moody teenagers (laughs) to work. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. That I find to be more distracting. I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> or maybe it's, um, do you feel like there's more pressure now that you have books under your belt? I've heard of, um, what's it called? The second, I can't think what it's called. Second book slump or something like that, where you, you have all these readers now who are expecting things from you, or does that not bother you at all? Um, it doesn't really bother That's me. good. I, That's I, a good thing. <laughs> I have so much time yeah. to be with these books that I know by the time I'm done that it's a good book. You know what I mean? And I I say that like knowing that I I just finished my sixth book and I definitely had that fear, you know, after like the first two, like, okay, like what if I'm going to be a one hit wonder? And then the second one, okay, well, what if that is just like (laughs) I'm on a lucky streak? You know what I mean? And then like, what if the third one? But now I think when I hit book four, I was like, you know, I'd actually be good at this. Like, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> the thing that I'm just capable of and I can do it. Love and I, I just think that like my process works for me. I've got really great beta readers. I'm having a good time. Like I'm enjoying getting to know these characters and learning their story. And it feels like a show that I'm watching that I'm really, really into. I and, love that. And it yeah. translates for my readers. It really does. And I, mm-hmm. I think I've got that confidence now. Like I think the imposter syndrome is a little bit like I'm over it. You know, I'm like, okay, yes, I'm that's good. Yeah, I think that I, I'm, I'm able to do this um, repeatedly. And my books are only, every single one is higher rated than the last, 
wow. which is very, I love that. I know yeah. that I'm getting better. Like I can actually see it, you know? Can, yeah, absolutely. You can literally see people enjoying it more and more and more. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's so cool. Do you feel like there's anything like a key thing that helped you? I, you kind of said this already, so I guess this question isn't as good, but besides the website that you mentioned, something that helped you in your success up to this point? Um, I think that loving what you do is so important. And that's true, even like for the cupcake thing, Mm -hmm. you know, I've had a lot of success, you know, obviously I didn't go to college for any of these things that I have done and like very successfully done. And I think the key element has been doing something that I love because when you love something, practicing it is very easy. Mm -hmm. You know, you're actually enjoying the learning of that thing. Um, yeah. And so I think that's why it's worked for me because the writing and the cupcakes were both the same thing. It was something that I really enjoyed doing and I really loved. It was that's never awesome. a time, like there's never a time where I'm writing and I'm like, God, I hate this job. Well, maybe sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No job is perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's when I'm feeling stuck. But it's yeah. it is like a 98% extremely rewarding experience that I yeah. really genuinely having a good time doing. I think that's so important in anything uh, that you do successfully. I love that. And I like, I have a lot of great questions about the romance, but one of the things you said about your next upcoming book made me want to ask what is coming next for you (laughs) before Um, we go into the... (laughs) So I do one a year and that one comes out in April of next year and it's called Just for the Summer. And it is... um, about, well, they meet through an Am I the A-hole Reddit thread. Oh. Uh, it's a very, very <laughs> fun plot line. Uh, basically, this guy writes this, like, Am I the A-hole Reddit thread? And in the thread, <laughs> he's asking the internet if um, he's the A-hole for naming his extremely ugly dog after his best friend. Um, <laughs> and he he did that because his best friend, and he, he goes on to explain that, Justin, the main character, every woman that he dates more than like a handful of times, when they break up, she goes on to find her soulmate. It's like this thing. His friends all (laughs) call him the good luck charm and they make fun of him. Well, the last woman that he dated um, when they broke up, she met his roommate, Brad, which means that Brad is her soulmate. And so Brad is like head over heels in love with this girl. And Brad is like, I want to move in with her. And Brad does and stiffs Justin for like seven months of rent. He's like, bye. And just like dips. Wow. So Justin is like very <laughs> upset about this. Um, he writes this Reddit post and um, he ends up, you know, working it out with the landlord where he um, is able to rent a smaller, cheaper unit. And it's like working out for everybody. And then the day he moves into the unit, he realizes is why this unit is so cheap. It's because it faces this billboard for this plumber um, <laughs> who's like he, the toilet king. And he's got like, <laughs> this giant toilet outside of his window. And Justin works from home. So like this is his view is this giant Great. <laughs> toilet with this middle-aged balding man dressed like Henry <laughs> Tudor holding a plunger over this, you know, f- toilet bowl of flies circling it and he's like, so pissed at brad and so brad makes fun of him instead of brad being like dude i'm sorry brad like thinks it's hilarious and sends him like every toilet king meme that he can find pictures of toilet king bus benches you know and um justin um as as an act of revenge goes and adopts the ugliest dog he can find <laughs> and he wants to know like he knows he's petty but is he the a-hole so the heroine, um, re, you know, her best friend sees this Reddit thread and sh- um, shows Emma, the heroine, she's like, did you see this? This guy has the same thing you do. Every girl he dates and breaks up with finds her soulmate. That's what happens to you. Every guy you date and you break up, he finds a soulmate. And she's like, you should message him and see if like he's had to be in a bunch of weddings like you. <laughs> and so they end up like meeting through this Reddit thread and they get this idea that if they date each other, when they break up, they'll break the curse and they'll both go on to find their soulmate. Oh my gosh. So I love decide, that. <laughs> yeah. Like that's the premise of the book. They decide that they're going to date and um, with the purpose of dating for this allotted amount of time and then breaking up so they can break this curse. And that's I love how that. it. Um, <laughs> it's really fun. Um, it's really funny, but also it's got my deeper themes. It is a book about trauma and the effects oh, wow. that trauma has on you and the Absolutely. people in your life. So it's going to make you laugh and it's going to make you cry. <laughs> they um, really do. Your books really do do that. I love that. 
Oh my gosh. How do you make your characters feel so real like that? They just sound like, you know, real people that, you know, we could run into them on the street. And I, d- I don't know how you do that. That's so amazing. Um, I think the first person POV definitely helps. Also, you know, I get a lot of questions like, how do you write such great dialogue? I write the way I speak. Um, okay. One thing I will say, and I think, again, this might be, it, this isn't anything that like anybody can learn, I don't think, but I am somebody that does have a very high amount of empathy. Like I find it very easy to understand why people behave the way they do, Mm -hmm. um, to put myself in their shoes. And I think that that really helps me write these characters that are relatable, Mm -hmm. that feel like you know them because I am able to know them um, just through that. And um, when I write dialogue, I write the way that I speak. And because I have a lot of empathy, I, I feel like it helps me pick up on like, cadences of speech and tone and like inflection for different people. And so I'm able to write this very believable dialogue um, that way. And, you know, people ask me like, you know, like how, like how I, another uh, one, one tip that I will give you is um, write your dialogue, just write it in a line and add your action beats later. Okay. Like just write write it down and then add in the filler, like, you know, or she's standing at the kitchen counter drinking a glass of water or whatever that way the di- and then read it out loud that helps so much read it out loud and Ooh, if it doesn't yeah. sound conversational then go back and do it again um and then like don't use words that you wouldn't use in a normal conversation like yeah. I, I read dialogue and i'm like why are you just talking like that you don't, you don't <laughs> it doesn't sound real and like yeah. say that word to somebody in real life you know like yeah um yeah what one word this I'll try and think of an example. Okay. Like very contemporary, like in the yeah. now romance. And <laughs> I remember reading that this character was like, I was standing there and I set my head atop the table. And I'm like, <laughs> Nobody would say that. Right. Tell a story to your best friend and use the word atop. Like, no. like <laughs> no. you know, I was standing there and I like just yeah. put my head on this table. Like that's how you would talk. And if you don't talk like that in normal life, it's going to sound stiff and unnatural in your book. Yeah. You know, I don't know why people change the dialogue, you know, outside of how you would speak in normal circumstances. I don't know either, but I find myself sometimes for word count adding things. I'm like, this is probably too wordy, <laughs> you know? I don't know. That's a really good point. So you feel like reading it out loud is kind of the special thing that helps you feel like this. Oh, yeah. Does this sound natural or not? Okay. I yeah. love that. Also, that's actually part of my, um, like, like my final edits is I have, I have this sister-in-law and she loves my books and I will call her once a year and I'm like, you ready? And she's like, I'm ready. <laughs> and I will read I my it. book to her over the phone over the course wow. of two days. And it helps me hear echoes. It helps me hear awkward phrasing. Um, mm-hmm. It helps me catch typos. Wow. It's so helpful when I read it out loud. And that's why, like, even when I get my audio book, I'll notice things I'm like, damn, interesting so too many times you know what i mean like it's starting oh to, no like, I hear it. um you know because obviously having somebody yeah. else read it to you is even more helpful than you reading it to yourself but yeah i, I read all my books out loud and I, I find that really helpful i love that do you like do you have to be like on the phone hold on a second i gotta change something or how do you like edit it while you're reading to her um, I will literally be like, oh, hold on, I gotta fix something. Yeah, I love that. It and then, and then keep it. She knows that this is part of a, a you know, the writing. <laughs> but typically, by the time I get there, the book is really very done. You know, like okay. I'm ready to turn this in. I'm doing my final read through. Gotcha. And, and it's mostly just catching like little things, like you know, maybe yeah. I use like a word too many times, you know, or, or an action beat too many times, or maybe we don't need an action beat there. You know, maybe it's going to flow better if there's less description of what's going on. You know, we're just boom, 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 you know, back and forth bantering. Yeah. Uh, I like that. Yeah. So if you're like, you're reading it to her and you're like, you know what, I think I'll just cut this. Then you just kind of scribble it out and keep going. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Does she give you feedback as well? Maybe does she go, Oh, you said, this or does she just kind of enjoy and soak it up? <laughs> She's just kind of sitting back and enjoying okay. it. Um, I love that. I'll stop and I'll be like, you know, what did you think of that scene? Like, did that yeah. feel right to you there? And, you know, she'll give me her thoughts, but mostly okay. she just listens. And that by itself is just so helpful to me yeah. um, to not have to like read it out loud to myself. By yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> empty room. Yes. Oh my gosh. She sounds like the best beta reader in the world. I love that. <laughs> yeah. She's pretty great. 
Um, so I kind of just went right into the writing questions because I enjoy it. But to jump back and do the really fun kind of rapid fire ones, what's your favorite romance trope of all time, whether reading or writing or both? <laughs> I love enemies to lovers. I love Would that you know? one. I love that so yes. much. Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I have a really hard time, though, writing that into my romances because I just I like to write cinnamon rolls and I have yeah. a really hard time. They wouldn't be enemies. Like, yeah. yeah. Like how can either of them be awful enough that they actually genuinely hate each other, you know? Yeah. Um, or, you know, for them to have that much miscommunication that they hate each other. I don't know. I, that's, that's a tough one when you're writing these soft boys. Um, you did kind of in the last one, though. Yours truly is a little bit of that. Yeah. Right? But it has to be with miscommunication. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, it's not real. Yeah. It's going to fall yeah. apart. You know what I mean? Like, I, and, and that's, I got like a little taste of it. But then, you know, yeah. obviously we, ha we have to fall in love with Jacob Maddox. So we can't yeah. we at it for too long. <laughs> yes. I like the misunderstanding trope. I like that because it's like, like you love both characters as the reader and you don't like hate one of them and mm -hmm. they're not a true enemy. I love that. It gets so much hate, the misunderstanding trope. And the thing mm -hmm. that gives me is like, that is so realistic though. It like, is. <laughs> for 20 years this year and I have a, I have a wow. fabulous marriage, like a fabulous marriage. And yeah. I'm miscommunicating with that all the time. You know yeah, I mean? like, same. Yeah. <laughs> you don't always say, you know, what you yep. think or what you feel. You misinterpret people, even people you know really well. Yeah. So it's so funny to me when people are like so hard on romance because romance yeah. does tend to lean on the miscommunication trope quite a bit. But, but it's that, so real. <laughs> it happens in real life. It happens. It's like, yeah. I'm curious, like, do you think there's a strategy to make it feel more authentic and like, because yours works. When you do misunderstanding trips, I always love them. But I, I think people hate on them when they're more cheesy and like they could have gotten around it, you know? <laughs> um, oh, gosh. They hate on mine, too. So it, Really? You know, oh, yeah. Like, people, really? there's just people that really dislike it. They them. just don't like it. Okay. Yeah. Another really hated trope. And I didn't know huh. this until I started writing romance and I got like a publisher um, is the love triangle. I right? love love triangles. I yeah. know. I know that there's some people that love it, but it is huh. actually like one of the most disliked tropes is love triangle. Wow. Not okay. And super baby. There's oh, weird. That is just, <laughs> they love that. Um, and then there's wow. people that will not touch a secret baby, you know, like where okay. he had a baby and she's hidden it from him, you know, for years. Like they wow. just don't love that. Um, it's so okay. funny how people just <laughs> lean towards different tropes. You know what I mean? But yeah. I don't know. I think that maybe again, like that's the, one of the keys to having like a very um, universally beloved book is choosing the tropes that are more universally liked mm -hmm. and not having problematic content in it and doing your due diligence so that people aren't thrown out of the story, you know, because you've got some medical aspect wrong or some fact wrong. Um, you know, maybe yeah. that's like, that's maybe that's one of the keys to having, you know, a, a book that's, easily digested by all. Yes, I love that. What where do would you say you get your ideas then? Do you go looking for tropes you love or do they do you pick them up from books you read or I'm super curious now. <laughs> um, so the the am I the ass can I say ass on this? Um, That's fine. The, <laughs> yeah. The whole idea actually <laughs> came from one of my really good friends. We were on this walk and she's like, God, I am like a foster parent for damaged men. She's like, you know, <laughs> they come and they date me for a little while and I fix them and then they go on and they find like they're happy ever after and it's never with me. And I was <laughs> like, there might be something there. I kind of yes. like, um, yeah. <laughs> and it's so funny because like, even though that's the premise that this book starts on, it ends up going off on like, it's completely own, you know, it, it ends up in a completely different place. Like you kind of even forget that that's how they met. Wow. Um, you know, that's just the vehicle to get them there. But that's where I got that idea was from my friend. And I, I sometimes that. I pull from real life. Um, you know, it just depends. It depends on the book. I love that. What would you say is like the most important element, like for you to have in your story that makes it good writing, I guess? <laughs> That's a weird question, but. <laughs> uh, I really, I mean, this is like obviously very genre specific, but That's true. I really have to feel the chemistry between these characters. And when I get mm. to the end of the book, if it's done and I sit back and I ask myself, can I, as the author, picture them still together 20 years from now? Ooh, if I, I love that. Yes, then I need to go fix something. I need to be able to sit back and, and literally imagine them 20 years. 
Wow. You know, and, yeah. and have I written them strong enough? Do we believe this chemistry and, you know, the foundation of this relationship enough that these two will still be together when mm. I come back, back on them? And yeah, that's good. If I can say yes, then I know that I've done my job. And what if you say no, then what would you do? <laughs> be honest. I have not said no very often. Oh, cool. Um, I love that. You know, I, I think... I think one of the keys to building believable chemistry between characters, there's a couple of like little devices that I use. Um, great banter. You've got to have the great banter. Yeah. That is where the chemistry is. <laughs> Even like in a movie, if you see a character, you know, when you see characters meet, if they've got that really great back and forth, yeah. like you feel that chemistry, it makes it very believable that these yeah. two can fall for each other. Um, another uh, device that I use is the inside joke. You know, they always... <laughs> develop some sort of inside joke between them that carries throughout the entire book. So you can feel that they have this bonding there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, of course, like the bonding itself, you know, maybe they've got like a common goal. Um, they've got that. something that, you know, they're both uh, doing together that like creates this connection between them. But, you know, one of the things that I love about romance is no matter how this is like the, my favorite thing about the genre. No matter how much you put them through in the book, you are required to give them a happy ever after or happy for now, or it's not mm. a romance. Yes. It's a love story. Those yeah. are two different genres. Romance and love story okay. are two different genres. Really? Love story Interesting. is Nicholas Sparks, The Notebook. Yeah. That's a love story. It's not actually a romance. A romance requires there to be a central love story as part of the book. And then at the end, there is a happy ever after or happy for now between the two characters. Mm. And I, I actually had somebody ask me that at a book tour stop. And they were like, well, what if she, what if they're not together, but she's just like happy by herself? Like they break up, but she's found happiness in herself. And I'm like, well, then that's women's fiction. Mm -hmm. um, or that's a love story. It's a whole different that's thing. Not, that's okay. Different um, okay. And the reason why the romance community is so protective of that description mm -hmm. um, is because people want to know that they can pick up this book and it is an emotional safe space. You're going to yeah. go through it with these characters, but at the end, it's going to be okay. And it you allows you that, to yeah. relax and like, you know, be along for the ride and cry and like know that, you know, these people are going through awful things, but it's going to be all right. And that's, that's so important so true. for this genre, you know, that, that um, we categorize them properly. Yeah. Because it's comforting to know it's going to be okay. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, like you said, a safe space. I love that. Um, you totally covered the chemistry. That was literally going to be my next question. So that <laughs> made me really happy because that was a lot of really good tips that I'm going to pull into my stories. Hopefully it's a little hard for fantasy to do like inside jokes, but I'm super curious how you come up with those. Cause I know like you had, um, what was the TV show in one of the books? I just loved it, how they bonded over a TV show. And I was like, mm -hmm. I wish I could do that in fantasy. Uh, how do you come up with things to bond over? Or does it feel like it's natural as you get to know the characters? It feels natural to me. I it definitely that. feels natural to me. Um, yeah. There's I, even like if I don't have an idea for it, most of the time I don't have an idea for it. It just sort of kind of pops up as you write. Yeah. It's like yeah. the characters are like, introducing me to themselves like I love that I'm writing them like, <laughs> I know them well enough to be able to write their personalities but maybe I don't know like all the little nuances and all the little yeah. things and their habits and all the little stuff that they enjoy um until I sit down and I start writing them and then just mm. stuff naturally occurs to me Yes. I remember at the uh, library event, you were saying that you, you kind of would go through a list of questions to get to know them. Do you have a list of questions or do you kind of, or do you sit down and get to know them and like brainstorm or like, how do you get to know them? I guess. <laughs> uh, I just think about it for yeah. a really long time. Sometimes I, love that. I will start with really knowing one character. Maybe he's a character okay. from a previous book. Hmm. Um, you know, okay, here, here's an example. So the best friend, uh, well, the friend zone is mm -hmm. about Sloane's best friend. Sloane is the main character in the Happy Ever After playlist, which I wrote first. So I knew that I was going to write Kristen's love story. And my best friend, I kind of put a lot of myself into Sloane. So by default, Sloane's best friend was going to be like my best friend. So very yeah. much drew on my best friend's personality to write Kristen. And then I gave Kristen the man that she needed, you know, which was somebody very laid back. He wasn't put off <laughs> by her sort of blunt, sarcastic, you know, deadpan tone. Like he actually liked that and, and 
was like really great at sparring with her. Um, you know, so sometimes I'll know one character and that's how I figure out how to write the other character. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, for example, I really knew Adrian in Life's Too Short. And oh, yeah. I knew that he was going to be this very like straight laced workaholic <laughs> attorney. Um, you know, he just, he never takes vacations. He doesn't do spontaneity. He's like always planning things yeah. out, you know, <laughs> very anal retentive. And I was like, well, I got to give him a girl who's going to like ruffle that up. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, let's go up north and like, you know, <laughs> let's go on a vacation. Or she was going to show him um, the, the more beautiful side of life. And so that's yeah. how I do Vanessa. Um, uh -huh. So it just depends. Like sometimes, you know, like I said, I, I will create a character because I know their partner so well and I need to create the person that's perfect for them. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'll have a really good grasp on both of them before I sit down and I start writing them. But again, they do sometimes reveal themselves to me as yeah. we're going. I love that. And I love how all your characters, they're like all in the same world. So as you read the next book, you're like, oh, I recognize, you know, so-and-so from the previous book. Mm -hmm. um, did you, how did you plan that out? Or do you kind of pull new characters in? I guess, are you thinking ahead to the next book when <laughs> you're writing the characters in the current book? Uh, not or do that just happen? Really, like, <laughs> I don't know. It's a kind of a mixture of both. So like, sometimes I will know like way ahead, like, yeah. Okay, Brianna is going to be the next, you know, the next one. I, I, I think love I was that. like maybe 25% into Part of Your World when I realized, I think I like, Bri I really like Brianna. She's like sort yeah. of this little spitfire. And yeah. <laughs> I always wanted to write a divorced heroine. And so I was like, I think I'm going to make Brianna my next character. And so I actually changed Brianna a little bit. I made her Salvadorian. Wow. Um, I started to like um, sort of mold her character into who I needed her to be for the following book that makes sense uh, now for just um i'm sorry for uh just for the summer that character was just like a very tiny small side character in yours truly so oh, okay. everybody's like are we getting benny's book next <laughs> and i'm like no benny's wrapped up like at the end of yours truly benny is like very wrapped up yeah. um I, I just took this little tiny side character and plucked him out and made him the main character in my sixth book and the heroine we have never met before. Okay. But there's so many Easter eggs and just for this. I love story, that. It is, <laughs> I'm, I cannot stress enough. Yeah. Read part of your world and yours truly. Before <laughs> you ever get your hands on my sixth book because you will just die for all of the I love Easter that. Eggs. It's, <laughs> it is such a wrap up of the two books that preceded it. And all my books are yeah. standalone. So you can, you know, read them by themselves and, you know, feel like you're missing out, but it's so much fun yes. to read them and just, and to catch them. <laughs> I love Easter eggs. I love I them. do too. I do too. <laughs> Some of them I know that I'm going to like work in later and then others, you know, it, it occurs to me like, as I'm writing, like, oh, I could put this in here. Like mm -hmm. uh, in yours truly, Brianna goes to buy some stationery because she's writing these really great letters to Jacob. And I, originally I just had her like going to Target. And then I was like, oh, I could have her go to Paperweights <laughs> Cards. I remember with, that. Like, yes. Vanessa's old work <laughs> in Life's Too Short. And I was like, oh, well, I'll do that. You know, so you get these like little Easter eggs <laughs> that you might not even notice, but they're in there. I do. I notice them and it's so fun. Do you have a story Bible to keep track of them? Or do you just kind of remember like it feels like a world, you know, kind of? I just remember them. It feels yeah. like, I feel like these are real people. Yeah. And I actually know them. And, <laughs> you know, they're like my friends. I remember <laughs> all their little things. I love that. I don't need, you know, a graph. Don't need cards. Actually, yeah. <laughs> somebody in my reader group did make a graph. Like they really? made a whole thing oh my you gosh. Know, like, a, like a family tree or whatever yeah um, breaking down all the different easter eggs so wow oh i yeah. love that i love that the dedication it takes to make something like that it's hard even as an author so that's impressive um so now i'm super curious do you have any strategies when it comes to kind of writing relationships specifically and how you make them so powerful i know you talked about this a little already but one of the questions from instagram was like what is it about a romantic connection that makes it feel real, I guess you could say. And this is kind of chemistry again, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, like I said, you need to know at least one of your characters and then write yeah. their perfect partner. I love that. Uh, you need to ask yeah. yourself, like, who does that person need? Mm -hmm. um, another device that I use is get to know you games. So oh, you know, I always like to have them do something fun together, you know, in the, in the happy ever after playlist, they go to Goodwill and they have to pick out outfits for each other that they have to wear on the whole I remember team. that. 
I think it's like very telling yeah. how these people, you know, behave mm -hmm. um, during these activities, you know, and then with Jacob and Brianna, they're always playing Would You Rather, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, these little <laughs> like get to know you games, I think are very revealing for the characters to each other and then also for us to get to know them as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just I feel like romance writers do not get enough credit mm -hmm. because a well-written romance will make you feel like you are falling in love. Yeah, it will make you yeah. feel like. And it that's really why does. it's such a book hangover when you're done, because it's like, <laughs> oh, the relationship's over. Yeah, <laughs> that's so true. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, just the same way, you know, a thriller writer, um, you know, a horror writer will get your heart racing. You know, I mm -hmm. think a really good romance author can make you feel like you're falling in love. Oh, and yeah. you just have to look at real life relationships and emulate the things that make your heart go pity pat. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, and then speaking of things that make your heart go like that, is kissing scenes hard to write? I had one question on Instagram was like, what's your advice on writing a kissing scene? And in general, like the, I guess the physical side of it. <laughs> um, so my books are like low to medium spice. And I don't... I don't write them super spicy um, just because I don't know, like I, I, I'm not really that good at it. Maybe. I don't know. I think you are. I think it feels natural. <laughs> I do think it feels natural, but I feel like if, um, if I were to force it and make my scenes spicier, it wouldn't gotcha. feel natural. I gotcha. feel like it would feel very forced. So okay. I write within my own comfort level. And then as for the kissing like scenes, Gosh, I wrote some really good kissing scenes <laughs> into just for the summer because, part of the deal, you know, it, it, when they're trying to like break this curse is they have to hit these like common denominators, yeah. right? Like they've got a date, they have to go on a certain amount of dates, they have mm -hmm. to be a certain amount of hours, they have to do all the common denominators that qualified for these, you know, breakups that led to the soulmate thing. So one of the things is they have to kiss. Their thing is throughout <laughs> the whole book, um, four dates, one kiss and a breakup. That's what they oh, have wow. to have. So the that. kiss is like really important and um justin really drags it out and like you know makes it a whole <laughs> thing um you know kind of like he starts to fall for her and realizes that once she gets this kiss what's to stop her from breaking up with him because he's fulfilled the obligation oh sure and he wants her to stick around longer so he doesn't kiss her and like Aww. he's supposed to kiss her that's part of the transaction like she can't kiss him or won't count oh man <laughs> um so you know there's some like really really great chemistry and like yeah. tension and and like build up around their first kiss and it's just so satisfying when it comes i love that <laughs> uh, yeah i don't know like honestly it's so hard for me to even explain like how i write the physical scenes. Um, but you know, I will, I will tell you this for part of your world, the book starts off with a one night stand mm -hmm. and I did not show that one night stand because I felt like the readers would not be invested mm -hmm. in that yet. The readers that makes don't total sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't show those two physically together until probably like mid book because the readers don't know them enough for it to not just be like egregious at that point. That makes sense. Um, so yeah. I actually waited, you know, um, I don't know, like there has to be that emotional payoff. You've got to build it up. It's got to be, you know, poised properly before you pull it off. Yeah. Um, and I, and I honestly can't really explain how I do, how I do that. <laughs> formula to it but i don't know how yeah. to explain it. well it makes sense it's kind of like what you said before where you were like the um a book is like a relationship where you're falling in love so you have to have that natural progression of getting to know them like you said it makes total sense mm -hmm. to yeah have that relationship almost aspect between the reader and the author <laughs> I love that. Um, okay, so to wrap up, because I, I think I'm taking us really long here, but this is so much fun. Uh, what is something on your author bucket list that hasn't happened yet? Because you have so many cool things that have happened. Uh, but something you'd love to see in the next however long. So I've got my bingo card. Okay. And oh, you do? Like three, yeah, there's three things on it. It's Ooh. all on my, my bingo card. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, I want to see somebody reading one of my books in the wild, like at an Ooh. airport or a park or something like that. That's like a big one. Um, I, I feel that. like when that happens, like there will be enough <laughs> of my books in circulation that like the universe has, br has brought me this moment. Um, so that's one of them. Yes. Uh, seeing one of my books on the big screen. Um, I think that would be very cool, but I must preface this by saying that this is like the author thing where mm -hmm. It would be cool, 
but I don't want it enough to sell my soul to make it happen. I Yeah, I where they it, change everything. <laughs> yeah, with the right production company, mm. the right TV network, um, you know, the right streaming service. Like, I'm not willing to say yes to anything just for this to happen. I want to make sure that whoever's going to do it does it right. Wow, um, yes. And then being multiple weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. I, I love that. Weeks on the list. So those are my three things. Those are my three goals. Um, you know, follow along. Let's see if I can <laughs> any of these. You absolutely will. I could see it happening. And I also love that you mentioned that you're not going to sell your soul and how I feel like that sounds like it's been a theme for you for your success almost where it's like, you know where you want to go and you're not going to let people take you on a tangent on a direction that's not a good fit. <laughs> yeah. The stakes are, and this is so hard to say, but like the stakes are not that high. Like that's I, good though. Yeah. I have a full-time job. Mm -hmm. I don't need to be an author to yeah. pay my bills. I don't need to do this. Um, I don't need, I don't need to do this. I'm yeah, doing this yeah. it's fun and it's yeah. fulfilling. And because of that, the stakes are not that high. I and that's perfect. <laughs> am really picky about what I say yes to, what I want to do, how, you know, how many books I want to write, you know, the quality mm -hmm. of the things that I put out because I'm in that position. I'm very privileged to be in that position, but that's really how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, maybe that's, you know, another secret to my success. Um, there's been things that I've turned down yeah. and I get counter offers that are better than the offer that I just turned down. Love and it's, that. Okay, now we're talking, you know what I mean? Like now, <laughs> it's worth it. now you know, now, we're, yeah. now this is a negotiation. Yeah. Um, it's such a good mindset to have, to just hold is. out for what's right for you and what you know is best for you and your stories. I love that. Yes, <laughs> if I didn't do that, I'd be writing bakery romances. <laughs> to say that they would have been bad. I'm sure I would have write, you know, written very great bakery romances, yeah. but it wasn't what I wanted to do. And it would have been like right. the start of me doing something that I was not fully invested in or fully passionate about. And I mm -hmm. think it would have affected the quality of the books that I put out. That makes total sense. It would have probably removed a lot of the joy of the writing process mm -hmm. if you weren't doing the ones, the stories that you wanted to tell. Yes. That makes total sense. So if you could give an aspiring author like one piece of advice, this is a tough question, but what would you say? Write the book that you feel like writing. Love that. Don't, don't write the book that um, you think you need to write to get mm -hmm. your book deal. Um, write the book that you feel like writing because if you are having a good time, and you're into it and you're loving this story and it's just flowing out of you, the quality is going to be a thousand times better than if you forced it. Mm. And you'll be so much more likely to write something that others will enjoy if you are enjoying it as you do it. I love that. Oh my gosh, so much good advice. I feel like I could just keep asking you questions all day. I mean, thank you for staying longer. I apologize. But before I let you go, I should ask really quick, where can we find you online so that everybody can follow you? So I'm on all the platforms. Um, specifically, TikTok is a really great place to follow me. Um, I post a ton of videos of my dogs. My dogs are sort of famous. No, <laughs> yes, they are. My dogs are famous. They are um, famous. Yeah. In addition. <laughs> and the <weather> <laughs> Um, she's famous. She's a famous uh, poodle pointer. Um, and then I'm also on Instagram. I post a lot of great content on there. But if you're not in my reader group on Facebook, go join my reader group on Facebook. I do exclusive giveaways in there. I'm super active in there. If you want to like be able to literally ask me a question and have me answer it within 30 <laughs> minutes, that's where you need to be. You need to be on my love reader group that. on Facebook. I'm, I am I love the group. I give them like all sorts of perks and like, you know, advanced oh, I love that. Um, <laughs> my, for example, my meet and greet for my uh, book launch in April, we released the meet and greet tickets in the group first and they sold out in the group and no one else even got a chance. Wow. I yeah. love that. Oh my gosh. And you do a lot of cool events around the area as well. At least lately you have been. I don't know if that's uh, your standard or if that's around the book release. <laughs> um, this is sort of new for me because, you know, I, I became an author like right at the start of COVID. The pandemic. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I am doing a lot of Minnesota stops this year. I've got a book tour stop in Wasika. Um, and then another, I'm hosting Brenda Novak on May 18th. I'm not sure when this, when you're going to post this video, but, um, <laughs> Brenda Novak is coming to Minnesota May 18th. I'm hosting her. And then I'm going to be in Red Wing, I think on the 27th for, and wow. for a free library event. Oh, fun. Um, yeah. And if they, if they let me, I might even bring like Tess and Stuntman Mike. <gasps> I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I saw you brought Stuntman Mike in the box last time you were out or was it last time <laughs> recently? Box. He that was fun. Dive <laughs> off the table. Um, oh, yeah. and I'm also going to be in Duluth on June 10th at the Oh, Turks. wow. 
Okay. So um, I'm going to head up north and I haven't been up north in a really long time. So that's a I good one that. to join if you're up that way. Love that. And I'm I'm going to plug your website too. I'll put that below because I'm assuming that's probably the best place to find events uh, and all that good stuff. Maybe. Um, <laughs> no, I actually post most of my events on Facebook. On Facebook. So, okay. And in the group, like the group is the best place because they're, oh, and sign up for my emails that yes. I will put everything out via email too. Perfect. So, oh yeah. And your email has an amazing short story coming out. I saw, I was yes. like, oh my gosh, here, I'm signing up right now. <laughs> so the short story thing, um, there was um, a bonus chapter that was offered back like a year and a half ago. If you pre-ordered part of your world, you had 24 hours to submit your oh my gosh. purchase <laughs> and get this bonus chapter. And you know, I've got like double the fan base now, like double the readership wow. and so many people never read this chapter. So I was like, can we re-release it? Like, I, yeah. I think it's time, you know, um, yeah. so I am going to be sending that out via email, uh, in a few weeks. I'm going to give like a few more weeks to try and get everybody to sign up. Cause then I can argue, like, how do I get this bonus chapter? Yeah. Um, so sign up for my emails, uh, so that you can read that. Cause it's pretty cool. And I don't know what it's about. But it's <laughs> you guys asked me to write books about quite a bit. So yay! Oh, I'm excited. Okay, I will make sure to put that below. I'll make that the top link <laughs> so nobody misses it. And thank you so much for being willing to chat. This was so much fun. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. 